Wow, that's a lot of people. Anyhow, so my name is John Alexis Guerra Gomez. Yes, the full thing. And I come from a country called Colombia. And it's Colombia, not Colombia, by the way. But it's the place where I get to work in this beautiful place. This is Los Andes University. That is what I call work. And it's also the place that makes these beautiful mochilas, arawakas. And I wonder what the life scriber is going to write in there. Anyhow, um, so it's a beautiful country. You should come and visit. <laughs> But that's not why I'm here. I'm actually here just because I had a network. Well, actually, no, I didn't have a network. I had an idea, a question. The thing is that there was OpenBees 2014 and 2015 because I didn't know about the conference in the first time. And then I realized this thing existed, and I couldn't come. I applied like three or four times until I bribed Irene, I'm sorry, uh, to get accepted. Uh, but I, I could follow online. So when I was doing that, I actually realized some things. And the first thing is that I definitely needed to go. Uh, so I actually ended up paying by my pocket like last year. And then the other thing I realized is that thanks to these amazing bloggers and semi-journalists, people, we get to follow everything through Twitter in here. So that was quite interesting. And then I was getting so much information in there. But then I asked, am I getting it all? So, Am I actually following all the right people that I need to follow in database that are talking actually about that? So I started like writing some scripts to see if I can actually see that. Well, and then I started saying, well, what if I see and check all the people that are actually talking about OpenBees? And then I found more than 3,000 tweets, and this is from last year. So by the way, this year we are around uh, 2,500 right now. So we are kind of doubling that. And then there were like almost 800 accounts of people tweeting about that. And that was interesting. But then I had another question, that is that, what about the interesting people that are talk interesting database, but they don't really interact with the database, with the OpenBees conference? So for instance, where is Mike? There you are. So Mike Bostock, he didn't tweet about OpenBees last year. What? I mean, what were you doing, man? I mean, like, were you writing version 4, D3 Express, one of these things? Like, no, but seriously, man, thank you very much. Thank you for all the work you do for the community. That is Shakira. She's Colombian. She's not from Madrid or, sorry, Spaniards. Um, she's ours. Uh, but yes, thank you very much, Mike, for all the great work you do. He didn't tweet about OpenBees, but we definitely need to be following him. Otherwise, we will have missed all of this wonderful stuff about uh, D3 Express. So he wasn't there. So that's the moment I started saying, like, well, I had a realization. What if I follow all the people that you guys follow the most? And that was the moment. That was the click. And that was the moment. Pam, 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 pam. That's how we celebrate in Colombia. And then I say, well, that's it. I just have to follow the people that you guys follow the most. And that's how I come up with this list. And of course, Mike is on the top of the list, apart from the OpenBees conference. And then we have all the big figures in there. We have all loudly organizers. And then I knew, OK, that is an insight. That's something that I really care about. However, I love networks. And I come from Maryland. And I have done a lot of work on that. So, and we also have the beautiful D3 uh, networks visualization. So I say, let's visualize that. It will be even more clear. And then when I started doing that, that happened. So Nadia already showed us some examples of that, but that's what it's called a hairball. And that's what this talk is about. How the heck do we get that thing to actually show insights? And that's the important thing of doing data visualization. So I say, well, we can come from those 700 nodes, and then we actually show, like, say, the top 300. And what will we get? A hairball. Let's say we only get the most influential ones. So out of those 300, let's look only at the ones that we're actually tweeting about the OpenBees conference. And what do we get? Well, a hairball. So I say, let's find an algorithm that computes the communities in the network and to try to separate the different clusters and get all the data scientists and machine learning and blah, blah, blah that's going to solve the world. And what did you get? A hairball. So in that moment, I say, well, let's go back to my question. What was I asking at the beginning? And that what I was asking is, what are the most important people that I should be following? And then what I did is to create a scatter plot. I fixed the, the positions. And then on the x-axis, you have how many people they have uh, following them overall. And then how many people are actually following them inside the conference. And by the way, there is an error in here. But Mike Bostock is around here somewhere. Um, 
And what you have to find in here, and the interesting things about this, oh, sorry, is that he, he wasn't talking about OpenB. Sorry, Mike. Uh, but in any case, uh, what you can find in here is that we were interested, in, I was interested in following people around this area. I wanted to find people that I wasn't following and they were in here. Uh, and then you can draw your own conclusions and trying to find uh, what were the ones that you weren't following that with a good balance of how many people followed them at all. So to improve this, I actually removed the links. And that's the visualization I created. And then you get the big figures, Robert is in there, Jeff, uh, Alberto Cairo, and all of the nice uh, InfoBiz people. And then the other thing is that with this representation, I could actually add back the notes, and in that case, that mic back. And then here you have interesting stuff. And one of the most interesting ones is this one. Do you know who is this guy? Oh, I'm sorry, by the way, Mike, I need your help getting this thing to work. Um, <laughs> So I hope you still like me. Uh, please don't stop following me. Uh, so who's that guy? Who knows? That is Edward Tufty. And Edward Tufty has around 82,000 followers. But if you look at him, how many people are actually following him in the conference? And that was very interesting because if you know that his relationship with the community on Twitter is not the best with many people. <laughs> So it I was actually amazed to see that reflected in there. But anyhow, you can draw your own conclusions. Please, please don't stop funding the conference. Um, anyhow, so after doing that, I say, well, what if we actually look at how many tweets they did in the conference? And then is where we have our be beautiful bloggers and the people that are actually helping us uh, know what is happening uh, on the conference. And then you can see all the nice people that were doing that. So this is the type of things that we need to be doing, doing network visualizations. And there are a bunch of tools and techniques that we can use to actually untangle the hairball. So let's talk about that. And for that, let's go back to the basics. That's me on graduation day. That is Ben and Catherine, my two beautiful advisors, Ben Schneiderman and Catherine Plassant from the wonderful HEIL laboratory in the University of Maryland. And every time you talk to them and you start a new project with them, they will always say, what are your tasks? What are your users? And with that, that really stick to me. And when you're doing a network visualization, that's what you need to be asking yourself. What is actually what you want to answer with that visualization? So for that, I actually have to recommend you very strongly this book. So I'm using this to teach the two classes I'm, I'm teaching on database, both in Los Andes and in Berkeley. Well, I'm actually trying to push the people in Berkeley to, to use it. But this is Tamara Monsner's book on data visualization and design. And it's a wonderful book because it creates this amazing framework that helps you define what is the data that you're analyzing, what are the tasks that you're doing, and then how you can actually visualize that. It's a beautiful framework that you can actually follow simple rules, and then you will get better visualization just by framing on that. As you can see in here, I could give you a lecture like of a whole hour on the, all the different types of tasks. But the most important things that I have identified when I'm doing network visualizations is that there are two types of tasks. One are overviews, if you want to create, like, get a whole idea of the network. And then the other ones is when you want to query on a specific node. And those are the query tasks. So let's start with the overview tasks. So for the overview, I have already shown you some things. And this is, by the way, the uh, IEEE V citations network, a beautiful herbal. Uh, this is data up to 2015. And then the first thing that I recommend you when you're doing that is that instead of trying to show the whole network, uh, what you should do is to try to select the most important nodes out of that network. How do you get those most important nodes? Well, think about the task you have at hand. So in my case, when I was looking the open, at the OpenBees people, then I wanted to find the people that had the biggest number of followers that actually tweeted about OpenBees and things like that. When I was finding fishy doctors in Xerox Park, I was trying to find doctors that had like a, a very suspicious behavior. So you can find different matrix, ma sorry, uh, different metrics that you can actually use to rank those nodes, and then you select the most important nodes, in, one, in most important ones. However, if you have a very big network, the, the thing is that that network most probably will not be very well connected. So one of the simple tricks I did is that once you select that core of 10% of the nodes or something, then you should go and try to get the neighborhood of that 10%. So when you do that, it's a very simple trick. And then you have a small number of nodes that will create a representation of the network. And then if you allow the user to actually interact with that, 
and then select different filters, then they can actually get gathered insights from that. So the next thing is that you can use communities, community detection. So that was something very common, and I, I really hated every time having to go to R and then running the, the queries in there and clustering in there. So what I did is that with the help of um, some code that I found online, I created a library called NetClustering.js. NetClustering.js is the library that allows you to go from this to this. And the most interesting thing is that it actually runs in the browser. And the beautiful thing about that is that you can actually let the user create a lot of filters, select the nodes they care about, and then cluster. And it's actually acceptably fast if you have a good enough network. And by, by the way, if you try to show more than 1,000 nodes on, on a browser, there's not much that you can actually see. But even on a network like that, it will take only one or two seconds to, to cluster them. Now, even showing something like that, you can see that it's like, yeah, you see the colors and everything, but you don't really see the actual clusters. So using an algorithm called group in a box that distributes things on a trim up, of course, it had to be a trim up, I come from Maryland, um, it separates the nodes into their own boxes. That is what is called group in a box. Use an algorithm created by Cody Dion, or a very good friend of us, and Ben Schneiderman, and many other folks in there. And what I did is to create an implementation of that on D3. I did it for D3 version 3, and then Mike changed the whole force simulation thingy. But actually, with the new system, I don't know if you have done um, networks in, the, in D3 version 4, it's amazing. Because right now, it's just a matter of creating a force that draws the nodes to a certain position. So today, I'm releasing the force in a box for D3 version 4. And it's as simple as just adding a new force to your simulation and then setting the different uh, link strengths and things like that, and you can get this. Now, the other thing I created is that if you don't want to see it on a trim up, then I actually created a force-directed meta layout for a force-directed layout. So what this thing does, is that it creates like clusters, and each one of those clusters will look at it as a node, and then that node, it will be used to create the FOSI in which each one of those nodes is, going, is actually moving. So if you actually see here, I can actually spend like the rest 15 minutes of my talk just doing this. <laughs> so it actually will adapt onto whatever resolution you have in there, and all of that is thanks to Master Mike. So thank you very much, and you can actually use it. It's open source, and it's super easy to use. Uh, please send feedback and things. Now, the other thing that was very useful, every time I showed my users these things, the next thing they wanted to know is like, oh, that cluster on the top, that one looks suspicious. Or I want to see who are the people that are in there. So that is what I call jump into a cluster. So the idea is that you can create some interactions that you can click on this. And then once you do that, it actually goes and only filters that node. And since we have the force in a box that can run in the browser, then guess what? You can recluster, you can redistribute on the screen, and then you can keep on repeating that as many times as you want. If you're doing that, you have to let the user know how deep they are into the rabbit hole. But other than that, it's actually a great way of filtering down into the details on demand that is the, uh, the whole idea of drawing insights. Now, having said that, another tip of something that could be really useful for, for doing visualization, and is what I did with the OpenBiz visualization, is just to have a fixed layout. So in this case, uh, I was very jealous because uh, you Americans had all of these beautiful grid maps and Chris Master Once Upon a Lot created his own representation in which you can actually see the different states with the same size. You know which ones I'm talking about? The ones that you see all the time with political results. But in Colombia, we didn't have that. And then the thing is that actually Chris wrote a beautiful article explaining how you have to pretty much do that, those manually. So I didn't have the time to do that, but uh, what I did is just, I created a force layout that represented the states in Colombia, and then uh, just by moving those states, I came out, came out with this one. And it's actually uh, one of my students in Berkeley actually created a new version of this for, for the US, US one, and it's actually quite useful. It's not really truly a network, but it kind of explains the idea of why fixing things into certain positions can be useful. Now, having said that, the other type of things that you can do on query, or sorry, on networks are query. And by querying, what I mean is that you choose one node, and out of that node, you can start creating something like a, that I call egocentric views. So with the, the type of, egocent the, the qu of queries that you can do with egocentric views is the same type of things that we saw early this morning with Nadia. That is that you select one node, and then you see what are the nodes that are connected to them, uh, that are one, twist, one or two or three steps away from them. 
And then if you can provide interactions that allow people to select one node and then expand that one on demand, that is marvelous for them. But I don't have much time for this, so I'm, I'm, not going, I'm going to jump very quickly on that. Now, all of that is all the different things that I've been doing on D3 that helped me untangling networks. But I also wanted to share, and this is for the first time in the world, we are talking about networkcube.net. Networkcube is a project initiated by Jean-Daniel Fequet, Benjamin Back, Natalie, and Paula, and Emanuele, or whatever you pronounce his name. Uh, they have been created this open source uh, application that is actually a framework that you can go and upload your own data. And the nicest thing about it is that it has the basics, network visualizations, but apart from that, they also have different representations that go beyond the node link representation. So if you guys actually click on the node link, it will scale very well, and it's also for dynamic networks, so it will work if your network changes over time. Uh, but apart from that, you can use matrix representations, you can use timelines, we already hear about them earlier today, or you can use even mixed approaches. So it's free for use, it's not commercial, and it's, it's just an initiative that we have been creating just to allow people to untangle more networks. So please feel free to use it and just to go and visit the website and let us know if you guys have any feedback on that. So with that, I would like just to give you some um, bunch of, of recommendations of the type of things that you can do for, for, for defining your networks. And is that always remember to define your tasks. Always remember that if you filter, actually you could be showing more, sometimes less is more, uh, that you have to define if you have tasks that are for overview or for query, and that there are many other alternatives beyond the node link that you can actually use with that. And by the way, that should be updating live uh, on the tweets that you guys are doing. I have been creating the hairball for, for this year, so there you go, so that appears a new one. Um, so with that, I will thank you very much and welcome any questions you may have.